Christopher says we may go. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our cold January 10th, 2022 uh, council meeting. We will uh, begin with our Pledge of Allegiance as Daniel Hester is with us. Great, we'll ask you to come forward and uh, give an invocation following the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pastor, if you would, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to live in this great country. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together as citizens to discuss the business of our community with our leadership. In 1 Timothy 2, you instruct us to pray for our leadership, and so we want to do that tonight, Lord. We thank you for those you have put in power over us and in authority over us. We think of our president and all the leadership in Washington. We pray you'll bless them, give them wisdom as they navigate through these difficult and troublesome times. We think of our governor and leadership in Indianapolis as they lead our state. We pray you'll give them wisdom. And for those here in our community, we think of our mayor, we think of the city council, we think of all the leadership here in Westfield. We pray you'll help them to lead soberly, to lead goodly, and to lead as you would be, you would have them lead. Help them to realize that they are here because you've put them here. May we understand that we are to submit to their authority and to their leadership, and we need to pray for them. May they realize they're gonna to answer to God one day for all they do. May we understand that as well. May we all work together to make this place a great place. May this meeting be blessed tonight. May everything be done to honor and glorify you. May we do all things decently in order this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. So well said. Trinity Baptist Church. Thank you, Daniel. Mr. Johns, would you care to conduct the meeting, sir? Thank you, Mayor Cook. Cindy uh, Gassard, would you please note the presence of a quorum? Joe Edwards. Here. Scott Willis. Here. Cindy Spalgeri. Here. Mike Johns. Here. Scott Fry. Here. Oh. Uh, Troy, Pat or, Troy Patton. Here. <laughs> Jake Gilbert. Here. Okay. We do have a quorum. Thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, first item on our agenda tonight will be the election of the City Council President, the appointment of the Vice President. I will entertain any nominations for those positions. Mike, I think you've done a good job. I'll make a motion you stay as president. Second. I'd second that. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. Cindy? I couldn't tell who seconded. Cindy or Cindy. Scott? It's either Cindy. one Scott. of us. Okay. Okay. Oh. Joe Edwards. Yes. Scott Willis? Yes. Cindy Spalgeri? Yes. Jake Gilbert? Jake Gilbert? Yes. Mike Johns? Yes. Scott Fry? Yes. Troy Patton? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, at this time, I would like to appoint my vice president. I'd like to ask uh, Joe Edwards to remain as vice president. Would you agree to that, Joe? I accept. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on, the council needs the uh, appointment of the two APC members. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we appoint uh, Mike Johns, yourself, and Cindy Spaljeric to be our representatives on the uh, Area Plan Commission. <clears throat> Second. Cindy, a motion has been made uh, by Joe Edwards, seconded by Troy Patton. Call the roll, please. Scott Willis? Yes. Cindy Spalgeri? Yes. Jake Gilbert? Yes. Mike Johns? Yes. Scott Fry? Yes. Troy Patton? Yes. Joe Edwards? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. 
Um, next item of business on the agenda is the appointment of the council's two RDC members. Um, I'd like to make the recommendation that uh, both Bob Bochamp, uh, uh, Bob Beaudry, no, Bob, Bob <laughs> Beaudry and Linda Nass remain, and the RDC is our council representatives. Second. Motion has been made by Mike John, seconded by Joe Edwards. Cindy, would you call the roll, please? Troy Patton. Yes. Scott Fry. Yes. Mike Johns. Yes. Jake Gilbert. Yes. Cindy Spalgeri. Yes. Scott Willis. Yes. Joe Edwards. Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. The uh, next item on our agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes from the December 27, 2021 council meeting. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. second. Motion made by Cindy, Spol uh, Cindy Spolgerick, seconded by Troy Patton. Cindy Gasser, would you please call the roll? Joe Edwards? Yes. Scott Willis? Yes. Cindy Spolgerick? Yes. Jake Gilbert? Yes. Mike Johns? Yes. Scott Fry? Yes. Troy Patton? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. The uh, next item on our agenda is the approval of the claims docket for January 10th, 2022. Counselors, do you have any questions regarding the claims? I, I did. Uh, I <clears throat> noted from the minutes that the um, BKD payments were to be placed in, uh, I forget the terminology, but it, not in jail, but in... Uh, um, <laughs> limbo? Limbo, yeah. I don't think that's the right word either, but they, to be placed in a holding pen, so to speak, until we get more information. Is that right, Troy? Well, we're hoping to discuss maybe this week. I think uh, Scott Willis is getting back to me and Jake on some times okay. uh, to meet with BKD and go through those things. So, so <clears throat> I would like to make an exception to the payment of BKD on that until it's decided that they've furnished the information we requested. Uh, I, I would second the motion that all items on the docket be paid with the exception of the BKD invoices, uh, which total approximately $48,000, and those to be held until, uh, until the next, next meeting, at which time uh, the ad hoc committee will have had a chance to meet with BKD and review those invoices. Second. Are you yeah, yeah, I guess you I seconded, second. so. Okay. Yeah, okay. You second so motion made by Joe, second well, my mic. Okay. okay. Cindy, will you please call the roll? Cindy Spalgeri. Yes. Jake Gilbert. Yes. Mike Johns. Yes. Scott Fry. Yes. Troy Patton. Yes. Joe Edwards. Yes. Scott Willis. Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Uh, our next item tonight is the uh, Westfield uh, Fire Department swearing in of the Fire Chief Rob Gaylor. And I'd like to turn the meeting back over to Mayor Cook to handle that. predecessor in the halls today. I was a little taken aback. Marcus Reed, who we honored for all his services, uh, uh, what, was at city service today. I'm like, Marcus, what are you doing? <laughs> he got lost. Uh, he ended up back and there. he said he's, uh, he's still working on the public ser uh, safety training facility Absolutely. that you well, well know. We own property over in Noblesville. And so he's, he's still haunting you. He's still around you, okay? Yes. Yes, he's still here. Okay, <coughs> all right. Well, we're honored uh, that you have uh, accepted this position, Rob. I, I thank your family for allowing uh, Rob to serve with us. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I'd like to administer the oath. So if you would, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, I, Rob Gaylor, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. <coughs> That I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And the 
Constitution of the State of Indiana. And the Constitution of the State of Indiana. That I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge. The duties assigned to me. The duties assigned to me. By the mayor to the best of my ability. By the mayor to the best of my ability. going to pin pin my badge. In the fire service, we have a lot of traditions, and one of those is a badge pinning uh, ceremony that we do. And uh, I see that it's only fitting my son being a career firefighter uh, from another part of the, the state have the opportunity to pin my badge. So I would be honored. Another tradition with the fire service is the fire chief typically gives a few words uh, just in closing of our ceremonies. Um, and right now I'd just like to take, um, first off, thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to lead the members of the Westfield Fire Department. It's uh, my privilege to stand here before you and accept this position. Um, I just have a few words because I understand there's a little bit of business to attend to tonight. Um, so with that being said, uh, this job firefighting is not for everyone. It's a true calling. We're all here because we love the thrill of doing things that others can't or often won't. Whether we wish um, to admit it or not, we live for the house bells to ring. Some folks just don't quite understand and they never will. It's not that we wish for bad things to happen to good people. It's that we wish to put our skills to use. We care about the human element and have compassion for those less fortunate. Critical skill for leading is first understanding ourselves, and as I mature and grow more comfortable with myself, I find my securities are faith, family, and friendship. These words are more significant to me than any title or position. With that, there are a few ex expectations that I have of myself and the organization. This is a job, it's not a hobby. Never lower your standards, and only mediocre people are at their best. I believe in being progressive. I don't believe in making change just to make change. Change is not progression. If we have learned one thing from recent events, it's that one's ability to embrace progress is more important than ever. Leader cannot produce or succeed if he or she cannot understand what progress really is how to deal more effectively with change, how to make change work for you. I mentioned back in 2019 at a promotional ceremony that I was giving, it still rings true today. Remember that amateurs built the ark, professionals built the Titanic. We need to challenge the notion that we've always done it this way. What we were taught wasn't wrong, it is the fact that the world has changed around us. The fire service is dynamic, and we need to keep it evolving. So with that, again, I thank you for this opportunity to lead the men and women of the Westfield Fire Department. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next item of business uh, is a presentation uh, on the student impact presentation, uh, the fundraiser uh, council table approval, and I believe Scott Willis is going to do a presentation for us. Thank you, uh, Councilor Johns, appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of the student impact board, I'd like to really kick things off with just a short video. Uh, most people here know about student impact, uh, but would love just to show a quick video to kind of summarize that for everyone. My mid-12 has been rocky. Yeah. 
because of family issues and I had my friends here that helped me get through it. I heard that Student Impact is a very safe place in that you can express yourself. Just a place I can go to get some peace of mind. No matter what's happened at school, like you just forget about it. Here. Or you can talk about it and it's like such a free place to like tell your emotions and talk to people about what's going on. When a kid walks through our door, it's a positive environment. It should feel like a warm, yellow smiley face. We just try to make connections with them and be one of those people that they can look up to, like a mentor. Like, they're a really good role model. This is your safe place here, and I think that it's really impacted it positively and helped with their mental health. You should come. Appreciate that. So, just some quick statistics about student impact. Um, in 21-22, we currently have over 322 kids in the Westfield School District that's registered for student impact. Um, that is a 33% increase from uh, previous year. In terms of our basketball league, most of you probably know Student Impact does sponsor uh, a basketball league for those um, kids 7th grade through 12th grade that uh, aren't good enough to make a team or choose not to play for the school. Um, it's a very uh, vibrant league, and I think this year we have over 407 kids that are registered. Uh, that is a 12% increase from last year. So as you can tell, uh, there's a real need, a growing need for uh, Student Impact in our community. They do both before and after care uh, programs. It is a Christ-based program. Um, and then, of course, also they do things like the Basketball League. Um, historically, in the Westfield City Council, we have budgeted money for um, fundraisers like this. Uh, I think last year we budgeted uh, $34,500. We only spent as a council, I think, around $11,104. Um, and this year's budget is 30000 so this would be the first ask, but I would ask that the council approve a $2,500 sponsorship table, uh, which will give us um, eight seats for that, whether the council use it or gives it to members of the community. I think it would be a, a good show of support for a, um, a non-for-profit like Student Impact. Uh, the event's going to be a black tie bingo event, which should be really fun. So those of you out there who own businesses or just like to get involved, we'd love to have as many sponsorships and attendees as we can. It will be at the Bridgewater Club um, in uh, late February. So with that, I would ask for questions or, or any uh, comments before we, we, we take a vote. Counselors, questions, comments? Hearing none, then, uh, do I have a motion to, to uh, approve a uh, expenditure of $2,500 donation to the student impact? So moved. And second? Second. Motion made by Scott Willis and seconded by Cindy Spaljuric. Cindy uh, Gosser, would you call the roll, please? You did say 2,500, Faith? Yes, yes. ma'am. Did I hear mm -hmm. Okay. Joe Edwards? Yes. Scott Willis? Yes. Cindy Spalgeric? Yes. Jake Gilbert? Yes. Mike Johns? Yes. Scott Fry? No. Uh, Troy Patton? No. Motion carries 5-2. Thank you, counselors. Uh, the next item on the agenda Mr. is... Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to comment on this. Although I voted yes, I believe in the program that they're doing, I think that we have to be careful in allocating money. I mean, I don't want to cast dispersions because y y you can go down a long trail, and I think we have to think out our not-for-profits, uh, not this, this is a bad one, but uh, we could probably get some flack about uh, church-related not-for-profits, and I don't know whether this is even church-related or not, but uh, I think we do have to be careful, and we have to walk a, a fine line there. I'm, I'm very much in agreement. I'm, I go to church every Sunday, <laughs> believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's public money, and I think you really got to think about that. Uh, when you, when we allocated 
And I think we have to be careful that we are not overbearing in it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not using the right word there, but I think we, there's a great amount of care that must be used in doing things like this. And uh, um, I hope they have a good, I hope they have a good fundraiser. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, I think I think we got to yeah. think about it. Yeah, and I, Joe, I agree 100% with you. I think that we need to be prudent as to how we spend our these funds and the uh, the nonprofits that we support. Uh, I know from the perspective of everyone in the audience, it sounds like we had a pretty quick vote on this, but I would assure you that each person, each counselor up here. Uh, gave a lot of consideration to this particular ask tonight and spent uh, more than just a couple minutes thinking about it. So um, I appreciate the, the input, the thoughts that, that all of our counselors had uh, with respect to this specific ask, so. Any other comments? Okay. Hearing none, let's move forward to the uh, next item on our agenda. The uh, ad hoc committee report uh, with respect to the BKD invoices, which I yeah the, yeah we kind of already addressed that. There really is none at this point. I mean, just uh, I think with uh, scheduling issues, I, I believe uh, Brian was out the week between Christmas and New Year's, and then I think some other people were out the next week. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping maybe th this week, okay. we'll, before the next meeting, we get this resolved and put to bed. So sure. good. Thank you, Councilor Patton. Moving on, uh, the first item under the old business is Ordinance 21-34, Urban Apples PUD. This specific uh, ordinance had a council introduction on July 12th of last year. Uh, APC public hearing on August 2nd. Uh, APC recommendation on December 20th. Uh, and it was, uh, it passed the APC by a vote of, of seven to two. And it's up for adoption consideration this evening. I believe Matt Skelton is going to present this ordinance to us. Good evening, members of the council, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, for the record, my name is Matt Skelton with Church Churchill and Antrim uh, with offices at 116 North Union Street here in town. Uh, with me this evening from the Urban Apples team is Michael Hainer and Noah Heron. Uh, the, the Urban Apples uh, location shown here uh, is approximately 24 acres, give or take, in size. The, it's just south of Sundown Gardens on Spring Mill Road. <clears throat> uh, Urban Apples is a family-oriented uh, agritourism destination. It's uh, uh, designed to be a place where community members and uh, visitors to Westfield are able to uh, relax and enjoy the outdoors. Uh, especially for, for folks who maybe have time in between events and things. It's a good uh, place to uh, relax, and, and it does include a, a working orchard and a cidery. Uh, the proposed uh, use at this location, if I can... <clears throat> represents a, a $10 million investment in the Westfield community. Uh, and just to be clear, there's, there's no tax incentives or abatements being requested uh, for this proposal. Uh, this item, as Mr. Uh, President Johns uh, mentioned, was last before you in July. Since then, we've had an opportunity to work very closely with our uh, site engineer, our landscaping architect, our uh, building architect, uh, the plant commission and also the planning staff uh, to review and revise the materials that have been incorporated into the ordinance that is before you this evening. Uh, a couple of just highlights uh, to the PUD ordinance. Um, you, you'll notice if you spend any time looking at it that it is dramatically simplified from what you saw before. The uh, When we were last before you, there were several additional definitions that for a variety of reasons through the process were able to be eliminated uh, and simplified. The overall structure of the ordinance is much simpler. Uh, the permit, permitted use uh, section of the ordinance is, is much more simplified. 
Um, but specifically, uh, this is designed for the uh, wine production area that was approved by variance uh, in 2020. Uh, the cidery area is to be located uh, it, uh, towards the back here. Uh, and this is a, a future office building and greenhouse area uh, in the front. Uh, one of the uh, uh, items that you may be interested in and you may know by now, but originally as contemplated, there was a animal interaction element to the land uses, and that's been eliminated. The plan commission, uh, there were a few members of the plan commission that just had apprehensions about uh, having that incorporated into the PUD at the onset of this proposal and reluctantly we, we removed it. We, we think that it would be a nice thing to have included someday, but uh, if that is to be addressed, it'll be addressed at some future time by some future decision makers. It's not a part of the immediate plan. Uh, I think the I'll, I'll I think I can conclu conclude my remarks here. I just I did have received a couple of questions about the music shelter area uh, here that has drawn uh, more attention than than I probably originally would have imagined. Uh, but the uh, there is a music shelter that's approximately the size of a two car garage. Uh, uh, it towards the, uh, the the internal part of the site here. Uh, one of the questions that has been asked is, how are we going to make sure that the uh, that sound uh, that emanates from this area uh, is in compliance with all the city's standards? And uh, that, and I think that's accomplished in a few different ways. For the for the most part, for the first of all, uh, the ordinance requires that this uh, 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 shelter be oriented to the to the northeast. Uh, and the northeast, <clears throat> from here to the northeast corner of the uh, property is approximately four football fields in length. And there, are, there will be structures between this uh, and, and the property line. Uh, the nearest home that is used for a dwelling is, is approximately 2,000 feet away to the northeast. Uh, there, are, there is a, a neighborhood Somerset planned to the west and south of this location um, on this property here and this property here. Uh, we have been in close contact since long before we ever filed uh, this proposal with the uh, folks, the Somerset folks, uh, that will be closing on the property uh, in February. Uh, uh, regarding our plans, how, the, how we have designed the proposal, what their plans are, uh, and it's been a collaborative process all along. As a matter of fact, they submitted a letter of support uh, to the uh, plan commission. It's on file, it's of record, uh, and it indicated they, they view this proposal as, a, as an amenity that they plan to market to their, um, the people that they are selling to, they will sell to. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the council members asked that I clarify this. The uh, music shelter is a area that is utilized about eight to ten uh, times per year, uh, based on on weather. It's not an every day, uh, every night, or every afternoon uh, usage. It's about eight to ten days per year. Uh, we did uh, design a mound system uh, to the to the south and west uh, here. Uh, it'll not only uh, provide a, a purpose that, that may include some buffering, but it also will be an aesthetically pleasing addition. Uh, and this is one of the, this is the heaviest uh, uh, buffer planting, mounding planting that is contemplated in the UDO today. Oh, and, and I think just lastly, uh, as part of the uh, discussion with the plan commission, there's a somewhat unique uh, set of standards, but I think it might be a, a, just a good practice uh, that this area, it, prior to any uh, occupancy of this structure, uh, there is a requirement within the PUD ordinance that uh, it be tested by a sound engineer of the city selection. Uh, the petitioner pays for that. Uh, to determine uh, compliance with any and all uh, standards applicable 
uh, to the use of the shelter. And if, and if it doesn't pass, there's no occupancy, it can't be used. So uh, with that, I, I just would like to reinforce the petitioners, uh, Urban Apples team is, is very excited and, and ready to begin site work as early as they can. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they plan to begin engineering work this, over the cold months and, and site work as early as they can uh, this year. Uh, with that, I'll answer any questions that you uh, may have and we would appreciate your favorable consideration, please. I guess I'd like to, if possible, go ahead and kick off the comments here. Um, as I was, as I am on the APC and I was one of the two members that voted against this project. Uh, one of the main functions of the APC is to make recommendations to the legislative body, the city council. The city council is charged with reviewing these recommendations and with adopting or rejecting the request. The APC gets the details of the proposal. How, do, how, how do they look at that? How does it fit within the conference plan? Does the proposal meet the UDO and or the, and or the, the what variances are requested and are they acceptable? When the city council reviews the APC recommendations, it considers ish, several other issues three of which include, is the proposed land use consistent with the vision of the city? Will the adjoining properties be effective in a substantially adverse manner? Is the ordinance enforceable? The city council's review of an APC recommendation should always include careful consideration and debate. It should never be a rubber stamp. There are times when the details of a project meet code and are technically acceptable but the project itself is, does not meet the growth plans of the municipality. In my opinion, the APC has done a pretty darn good job over, uh, over the years analyzing petitions and making informed decisions. During the past two years, I'd like to remind the council that it has only rejected one APC recommendation. So that's a pretty good record for recommendations coming forth from the APC. Ordinance 21-34, the Urban Apples APC, was passed with a split vote. I believe that it is a flawed ordinance and I do not support it. It is a proposal that evolved over a long period of time with a tremendous amount of input from APC members to get to the point where the majority would pass it. And it actually was evolved for more than just uh, since August of last year. Um, I think that it's important that we take a look at the evolution of this project. The project was first presented in June of 2020 as an exciting agritourism destination located on 35 acres with numerous Airbnb cabins in a quote, national park type setting, unquote. Following a public hearing, the commissioners had several concerns uh, to include the fact that the petitioner had taken liberty in quoting UDO definitions regarding agritourism adding to the leading words without acknowledging that the UDO definitions had been altered. I'd like to give credit uh, to those APC members who discovered these changes. After consideration, the APC members concluded that the request lacked clarity and detail. A couple called it intriguing, and a couple called it hodgepodge. The petitioner was asked to re rework the plan and add specificity. Over time, the petitioner withdrew the project hired the city's ex-engineer or ex-director of planning, excuse me, Matt Skelton to represent him and introduced a new project called Urban Apples. The new project was to also be an agritourism base with a farm animals, petting zoo, goat tower, cidery, winery. APC members continued to add constructive criticism and in the end the petitioner eliminated the farm animals, petting zoo, goat tower, the APC approved a project which is essentially a replica of the current Urban Apples facility with the addition of a cider building, swapping apple trees for grapevines and occupying five times the area. So after 20 months of negotiation, revised concepts and compromise, we are asked to approve a project that is basically a shell of which was originally presented to us. And let me share with you the five specific reasons that I do not support the project. First of all, big picture. It does not fit into what I believe our vision is for the area around Grant Park. 
In the past, we approved Grand Universe with a telescope and a space camp, the largest indoor go-kart track in America, one of the largest pickleball facilities in America, the largest whiskey distillery in Indiana. All of these are huge tourism and sports leisure products projects designed and requiring a significant investment. They are all high-level projects meant to complement and support our significant event, uh, investment in Grand Park. We were told that this project would be comparable initially to Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, or Fair Oaks Farm. It will not be. It is not a fam family-oriented venue as initially proposed or a destination. My second problem with this proposal is that the proposed structures are not constructed with the same quality of materials as the other buildings surrounding Grand Park. When agritourism-based whiskey, whiskey, West Fork Whiskey sought approval for their development, we sent their original proposal back to the drawing board. We required them to, to design and build an expensive, high-quality building that both they and we can be proud of. In this particular case, we will be approving the remodeling of an old wooden barn and a metal pole barn. Not to be nasty, but to be clear, it is a low budget operation. In my opinion, the remodeling and renovation of these uh, includes adding, uh, adding a glass, uh, glass garage door, paint, shingles, and landscaping uh, will lead to a product that uh, may be suitable for the country but not in a high-impact Grand Park location. I think that it would be reasonable expectation that a destination winery operation should look more like what you'd find in Napa or Michigan's Leyland Peninsula. That type of architectural design would be neat versus a renovated pole barn. As one of the APC commissioners said, quote, it is not really architectural enhancements as much as reconciling the architecture. Three, I do not believe that the APC gave adequate consideration to the noise element. The venue includes a 500 square foot music stage and it is, in, and, and it is the plan to provide music. Uh, it is extremely important to understand that the Silverthorne builders have already been approved for residential development bordering the west and south of this property and, and the uh, music venue. Um, Chris, can you scroll down to the bottom of this presentation? I think we've got a slide somewhere which will show the Silverthorne product project. I think Kim should have added that. It's not. Um, it's not in my It might not be in that presentation. I believe Kim's trying to put that into our... To the flat plan. Flat plan. Try that. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. So you can see the Silverthorne project to the west and the south, the Urban Apples project immediately to the north. I, I, I couldn't pasted this today so we could get a better view of it, okay? So the Urban Apples really should be scaled, shrunk in a little bit east to west to fit on that property. But you can see that there's a number of houses to the south which will actually uh, be relatively close to that stage and, and certainly the parking area and then also to the west. Uh, the petitioner claimed in his presentation that the closest neighbor was 2,000 feet away. And in fact, that is where the closest current neighbor is. But looking at the Somerset PUD, uh, we can see that the neighbors to the west are approximately 300 feet away from that stage and to the south are 400 feet from that stage. So considerably closer than 2,000 feet. While Superthorn builders are not considering complaining about the noise problem, I can assure you that a fair amount of residents purchasing these homes will complain. I continue to feel complaints from residents in District 5 that border the current Apple Vines, the current Urban Apple or Urban Vines location. Um, I would also add the, this to the to the to the fact that Silverthorne has given us a letter that they're okay with this. I would, I would cite the fact that while Silverthorne is a pretty darn good builder for this location, they also built a community that's, that surrounds the uh, Indiana Gun Club in Fishers. 
Now, the Indiana Gun Club was there 30 years before they built their community. It was a true infill community. But, if, but I've had many, many clients that have refused to move into that neighborhood because of the, obviously, the, the noise to the gun club, with a, which adjoins it in a similar fashion to this. So, um, needless to say, I suspect there will be numerous complaints regarding the sound. Um, this number four, my fourth issue is that the ordinance will, if approved, would continue, uh, will approve the continued use of two food trucks at this location. One of our APC commissioners commented that while he doesn't drink, the president of a food truck was exciting and that that would entice him to visit the venue. I'm more than a little concerned about this comment and his final observation. Personally, I'm not pleased with the approval of food trucks at this location. I believe that this gives an unfair advantage to the petitioner through the ability to offer food without the associated investment in equipment and facilities. It will have a negative impact to the brick and mortar restaurants located nearby, as well as to our own city owned restaurant at Grand Park, which is currently struggling to make a profit. I'm also concerned with the health and sanitation issues with food trucks. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, another APC commissioner who also had a problem with this and said, and I quote, we need a true food element, not food trucks. Five, personally, my biggest concern is that the staff has indicated that they are not in position to monitor this ordinance through code enforcement. When dealing with a petitioner or a developer, I think it's reasonable to take past experience with the person or entity into consideration. Based upon past experience, I must question whether this pet petitioner will adhere to the written ordinance. The APC in place in 2019 had an issue with the Urban Vine location when it was discovered that this facility was not built for plan. The commission noted that the grapevines which were to be in front of the building had been moved to the rear and the parking lot which was to be behind the building had been relocated to the front. The landscaping plan had not been followed and several other issues were non-compliant. I happened to attend that meeting as a resident and heard Kevin Todd explain that his department lacked the manpower to enforce this ordinance and that enforcement was the responsibility of the city council. So when this particular petitioner approached the APC for approval of this project, I asked Kevin Todd at the APC meeting if he would be able to enforce this ordinance. He told me that he still does not have the manpower to enforce it. I was amazed and disappointed with his remarks. Counselors, I believe that we probably have a significant problem here that we need to address at a future time this year and discuss what we need to do to, uh, to enforce our codes within the city because I feel that code enforcement is, is crucial and critical to the growth of the city. So as previously noted, this specific ordinance has been worked in, pro in a work in progress for 20 months. There's been a lot of input from APC commissioners. There have been, there's been a lot of compromise. Last year, the APC members took a Purdue Extension course in which we learned that compromise can be good and bad. To quote our textbook, quote, plan commissioners have a natural desire for compromise. They want to find a middle position between developers and opponents. While such compromise might seem to be desirable, it often has a negative effect. Essentially, what happens is the developer quickly learns that the commission will, what the commission, that the commissioners seek to compromise, so they ask for more than they want and settle for what they initially desired. In this case, we have a petitioner who hired the Westfield's ex-planning director to help him navigate the process. <coughs> He asked for the world and eventually negotiated a virtual mirror image five times larger of the facility that he already has in operation. I agree with the authors of Purdue's APC course when they conclude that, quote, regular and predictable compromise does not lead to good development, unquote. And it is something that we will need to be pay more attention to in the future. I believe that this is a particular case that for the desire to compromise has exceeded good judgment. I will leave you with two additional quotes from commissioners 
as they voted for this ordinance. And these are the quotes. First, quote, I am hoping that everything happens as it should, unquote. And the second quote is, do it right and I will vote yes, please do it right, unquote. Those comments alone should provide this body with clear direction into how to respond to this particular APC recommendation. Councilors, I think that this is one of those infrequent times <coughs> when we have to do the right thing and reject this ordinance. So, those are my comments. Before we go any further, I should probably just point this out. It, it's, it's rare that we actually have, not maybe not 100% rare, but we have two counselors that serve on the planning commission and we did have differing opinions and votes on this. And I will say I was one of the yes votes on the planning commission. That was not without reservation. And I explained that at, at the time of my vote. Um, we worked for a long time trying to figure out the details on this to make it happen. There were reasons to actually, in my opinion, see this through. It seemed that the community is actually excited about this opportunity. Um, in, in going along and thinking about a potential kind of entertainment trail, if you will, I mean, to be considered somewhere along Spring Mill and going up to the distillery. We also have another agritourism site just north of 186, I think it is there, um, just north of Sundown Gardens. Um, that this would be an attractive way to build that kind of entertainment corridor, if you will. That, that was one thing that factored into my decision and one of the reasons I was willing to compromise on some of the other things that I would typically um, not be compromising on. So, um, again, I did vote yes and it was with reservation and some of that had to do with compliance issues we've had in the past um, with this petitioner. Um, this is, it's a land use, it's a rezone, and I, I can't factor in necessarily that um, the person doing the project, I mean, it runs with the land and it, you know, he could sell it tomorrow. And just like we always say, um, it's good and bad because we hope it'll, it'll come out like what it's proposed. There are times it doesn't. And that's why you heard the, the comments and, and worried about the compliance issues because we, you heard at the plan commission, please, please, please do this right. So what was sold to us and what we're planning to see is, is for me the concern. And I, I had to give some grace there and say make it happen. And one of the reasons I did that because the things that have been out of compliance with this petitioner, uh, he has brought into compliance and often at significant cost to himself. So. Well, he did make those, those wrong decisions or, or actions sometimes, he did rectify them, so I appreciate it. Um, just don't want to be seeing that happen again, as the others mentioned before. So again, we have this kind of split vote here with, with this one. Um, and like I've said before, there's reasons to vote for this and, and reasons to not. So um, the reasons for outweighed it for me this time. If I could add a couple of comments as well, I've kind of followed this very closely for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, because I'm a huge fan of Urban Vines, and every time I drive by there, I'm amazed how crowded it is. I mean, it is crowded nightly. Um, it is hugely popular, and uh, I've been a big fan of that project for many years. Yes, I agree with Cindy and Mike both that um, mistakes were made. You know, you got a, a brand new entrepreneur in our community who's investing in the community he lives in, and um, you know he's he's new at that. And he's made some mistakes, and I agree with Cindy that I think he's worked hard to fix those mistakes and make it right when he's aware uh, that there were issues. A couple things I would just add is, first off, when you look at the location of this and you look at what's around it, I mean this is an infill project, and it's highly likely if this doesn't happen. We're going to get another higher density neighborhood, just like everything else around it. Um, I see this as a win of, one, it's more agricultural based. It's a business, which will bring us a different tax revenue as a result. And it does lower that density in that area. Um, you know, you look at everything around it, and I just don't see with a, um, you know, when you've got a landscape coming right next to it, I just, I don't know what else fits in it than something like this. I understand the concerns of architecturally 
Um, it doesn't fit what's around Grand Park, but this isn't around Grand Park. Um, it's down the road from Grand Park, and it certainly elevates the architectural standards of what's already there, uh, which is, again, <coughs> Uh, uh, you know, Sundown Gardens, who was a great business, certainly not bashing them, but um, when you look at the, the architecture of that building, it doesn't compare. This certainly elevates from that. The other thing I'll bring to everybody's attention is, uh, and I love West Fork Whiskey, by the way. Uh, the, the owner of that business lives in my neighborhood, but they ask for abatements. And we have a local business owner who's not asking for abatements. I'm sure if we're willing to throw a couple million dollars of abatements at him, he would probably raise that architectural standard if we think that's necessary, but he's not asking for that, and I do think that it does fit into uh, what we already have there. Uh, in terms of food trucks, hey, I'm not a big food truck fan. I've never bought food from a food truck, I'm gonna be honest, but I'll tell you millennials and younger folks, they do. It's hugely popular, and uh, I've traveled the country for the Marine Corps, and we, as Marines, tend to end up at a brewery, and almost every brewery you go to, especially along the West Coast, they're serviced with food trucks. It's just kind of, what's coming, it's kind of the, the standard of, of what happens today, and I don't believe it has a huge impact on other restaurants in the area. Uh, when you look at folks who are uh, using those food trucks, they're sitting on a lawn, they're sitting outside, enjoying the outdoors, and they're grabbing some food and sitting on the grass. I just don't see that competing with a dine-in restaurant. Uh, others may disagree, I certainly appreciate that, but I, I guess I just don't see it that way. Um, and, and lastly, um, you know, I, I, I do believe we reward those in our community who invest in our community. Um, Urban Vines is, again, a wildly popular uh, destination. This is similar in some ways. It's different in others. Um, but I think it not only allows those from Grand Park to take advantage of this, but it does provide another opportunity for outdoor activities, um, which, especially in the days of COVID, is something that, that I think our community could use and wants. So that's my comments. Matt, I don't know if you have any comments before, because I've got, I, I just want to, before I, I want to. <laughs> I can, I'm ready to respond anytime somebody wants me to respond, but I. I Go ahead, and I'll, I've got a okay. couple of things. So. <clears throat> well, just, I, I'll try not to hit every point by point, but I do think it's important to, when, when you think about the, the bigger picture vision for uh, not only uh, the Grand Park area, but uh, specifically, uh, an agri this is an agriculturally zoned area. The comprehensive plan contemplates it as being a, a residential low density kind of zoning uh, in this area. But I, I will also uh, tell you that the uh, uh, agritourism and agricultural use, this is exactly where the Unified Development Ordinance contemplates this kind of use. And so, I, I, you know, to the extent that a, vi a vision is not seen or understood, I don't know how to fix that right now, but I, I can just tell you this was done very methodically to be located in a place that it, 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 it the UDO contemplates it in, the, in, the, in, ag in an agricultural district. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> the quality of materials, the minimum quality of, uh, of materials that are required in this PUD ordinance are higher than, than West Fork Whiskey. It, West Fork Whiskey is metal buildings. They're two metal, but I mean, I'm not disparaging it. I think it looks beautiful and it, I think it, it'll be uh, a wonderful addition to the community, but their minimum requirements are lower than the minimum requirements uh, of this PUD ordinance. And I, I already covered the noise <coughs> issue. I mean, it's it's been addressed and addressed and addressed in kind of like, you know, eight layers of addressing uh, 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 noise and sound, uh, and that, frankly, if, if, if people are too uncomfortable with that, that can be eliminated. I don't think that makes this a better project, but that aspect of this project can easily be removed if that bothers people that much. But this, this is probably the best outdoor music venue design in the entire jurisdiction, including your own uh, amphitheater here downtown. I mean, from a location and orientation perspective. And the, uh, from a food truck perspective, just keep in mind, um, can I borrow that? <clears throat> this isn't a, a free-for-all with food trucks. 
Uh, there is up to two permitted and they can only be in this area. So they're not vending to outsiders. I mean, these are, these are food trucks that are vending to people who are already on the property. Uh, it's not somebody who's like, I mean, it, it's not like uh, e even Grand Junction Brewing Company has a food truck right out by the street and, you, and it catches your eye. But even they aren't vending to drivers by. I mean, they're vending to people, for the most part, from within their own, uh, their own uh, store. <clears throat> and then, uh, as far as code enforcement goes, code enforcement on this, there's like three layers of regulation, one of which is included uh, in this PUD, and there's nothing that would prevent the city uh, if it had to, and we're confident that that would not be necessary but from enforcing. And if there's a conversation that needs to happen between the council and the administration, or if we need to ask Kevin Todd to respond to that, I just, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to do that. I, I, I've done it for a living for 19 years of my life, <clears throat> and it can always be done. Uh, and then, uh, as far as, I think that <laughs> there seems to be this kind of lingering, uh, issue about you know this whole past performance which is is a behavioral issue it's not a land use issue but past performance with urban vines and I think if I mean Noah's here so he could speak for for himself on that project this proposal designs around everything that was discovered to be a problem during that that the evolution of that process that that project is a very popular, that's a very popular place. I think somebody told me that it, um, Urban Vines has more followers than um, Sun King Brewing Company. I couldn't believe it. But the at the in, end of the day, um, all of the, I, that was designed to be a, uh, a winery with a tasting room. And what was demanded and what people wanted when they came there, it evolved, evolved, evolved. And this actually designs around all the problems, all the things that were discovered uh, during that, that whole experience. And I, I've heard a couple of people say they get 40 emails a day. We, I don't think Noah has not received any word from any about anyone about any uh, compliance issues or any complaints on ur urban vines in over two and a half years. That's probably normal. People are, you know, gripe in the shadows, you know. More than anything. So it, it, there are issues that we're, we're unaware of them. And I, and I think the exercise with the plan commission and part of why it took as long as it did, uh, and, and frankly, I can't speak to anything that happened uh, before me. Frankly, I, I've been involved since uh, the, about, for about six months on this project. And, and the goal was to take all the guesswork out of this. Hoping isn't necessary anymore because about every loophole that could be discovered in this PUD has been addressed through this process. Now, maybe somebody can dream up something that I haven't, but, but that was the whole exercise with the plan commission, trying to make sure that uh, this PUD is as uh, narrowly tailored for this use and this location as possible, and that's what's before you. So. Okay, sorry, I've got, I know there's a football game on so, <laughs> soon, so trust me, and I'd like to go watch I'm, it. I'm myself. sorry. <laughs> um, but I have, I have a couple questions. Yep. Uh, because, and I've talked to you, I, I'm actually torn on this. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I waver back and forth on a yes and no. So I just want to make sure, from my own personal standpoint, at one point, we were talking about like a $10 million investment, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that still the case? It is. Okay. So um, is, that, is that something, um, and, and I'm going to ask the attorneys here for a second, uh, is that something that, you know, we say, hey, if somebody's going to put $10 million into a project, uh, is that something you can say, hey, before you take occupancy, we have to confirm that they've actually put the money into it? Because it's what I wouldn't want to happen is say, let's say we say yes, right? And then, um, and then uh, they just put, you know, like 800,000 bucks into it, just kind of slap it together and then we go, hey, yeah, I mean, we're good, right? I mean, what, what, what's the... Yeah, I so mean, you can't do that in the PUD ordinance, you can do it in the development. You cannot. Later down the line. And as long as it, for, 
reading this one at least, that, that wouldn't be possible because of the minimum standards. Matt can speak to that. Um, but in the development uh, agreement later on, if somebody does do this, you can certainly require uh, certain parameters as you outline. Okay, but you can't on the... No, he, here you, you can accept it, reject it. You have to do that within 90 days. You can make text amendments to the ordinance, so certain other parameters, but requiring a, that it be a $10 million investment is is a little bit beyond what the, what the rezone requires at this point. Okay. But you do have an opportunity to do that later in the development process. Okay, Qu sorry, another question for you. And, and can, I, can I just touch yeah. on that? And I think with, uh, if it were a case where you were seeking something from the city, like a, an incentive or some kind of abatement or something, there are pledges that are often made in exchange um, for that. And that's just, we're just, that's not, th this, this model does, does, doesn't include that. It okay. doesn't include that, but yes. What, 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 are the, what, are the, what are the real estate taxes now and what are they expected to be? I, I have no idea. I, I, mean, I, I have no idea what they are now. They're, 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 it's, it's, they're minimal. The zoning is definitely different, right? I mean, currently, oh, I mean. Yeah, it's, it's agricultural. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 minimal, I'm sure. And then it'll it'll end up being an assessed whatever the county assesses uh, the property at, which we don't have direct control over, but we know what we're going to be investing. But a lot of times like with commercial projects, we have an idea of what those taxes will be. Right? <laughs> yeah. The original assessment is based on the owner's own estimate of construction because there's no real market value assessment yet. So that's where the county starts. And then generally the assessed valuation is three quarters of that. And then you can break it down in your tax rate from there. Yeah, because you know a lot of times like when we see commercial projects, they, they give us like what we're gonna be getting, you know, I mean, I don't know. So this is what I would, this is, I mean, this, I'm sure nobody wants this, but this is what I would suggest. Cindy and Mike are both yay and nay on this, and, and, and truthfully be easier if they're both yes or both no, because then we, you know, because I, I, I kind of lean on, on them, and, and I, I think both of their opinions are valuable. And frankly, thank you, Noah, I mean, Urban Vines, uh, obviously they're maybe, you know, for putting money back into the community, I do appreciate that. Um, uh, I do have some questions. I, I mean, on the on the, you know, just the compliance side of, you know, I mean, if the parking lot was to be behind it and it's still in front, I mean, that's kind of, you know, you know, is that still an issue? I mean, uh, I, I know it's gravel. I think it's gravel in this one also. I, I didn't understand. It. What, what I mean, are, can you I, clarify that? No, I'm just saying from a, when we said you know initially that Urban Vines the the parking lot was to be behind you know uh -huh. um, vineyard in front. And that still hasn't happened, and maybe we've just said, "Hey, it's good enough." Um, so this it gets really detailed in the PUD, but there there is an order that the 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 improvements in the in the here have to be completed first. These have to be completed second, and they can and and for the use of either one of those buildings requires the issuance of a certificate of occupancy in order to be able to to use it. Yeah. And so, unless it's built in compliance with the plans that are approved, it doesn't get one. Yeah, which the compliance thing is obviously an issue also. I mean, and I, I, we've talked about that. I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, okay, this, this is what I would say, is that I don't wanna vote on it this evening. I mean, for, to be quite honest. I'd rather try to figure out and reconcile between, you know, make a motion to, to just create maybe a three-person committee to reconcile between the yay and nay. And I know that's not, that's not, you know, advantageous. I mean, if, if but, um, uh, I'm, I mean. I think we're looking at compromising. <laughs> we're just compromising, compromising, compromising. I know, I, 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 I know, <laughs> I, I know. I, I mean, um, cause I, I value both of their opinions. And I, and I, and I, as I've told you, I was, concerned that 4K said no, I mean, because I think, I mean, he's a, he was a developer. I mean, I, I think, okay, anyways. I, I that, think, that's, I, that's, I think you have a petitioner though, that there, there's not, it, it can be known what is needed in order to uh, satisfy folks. We thought we had done that. 
and that's and that's why yeah. we're here. Yeah. But if there are things that need to be addressed beyond that, I mean, you've got a person who a, a team that is willing to do just about whatever is required in order to get there. Yeah. I mean, within reason. I think, you know, there's a twenty thousand square foot building that is in good shape on the property. It may not look like much from the road, but it's actually in pretty good shape. Um, and and the the barn, the old wood barn that is falling down, it's not falling down. And it happens to be a 1860s barn construction that's gonna be completely rehabbed and, and restored. I mean, you can't just go create, you know, an 1860s barn structure. So anyway, I'm sorry to. No, no, okay. All right, anyways. So, so I have to ask you, if this gets voted down tonight, all right, would, how soon can it come back? I'm assuming it would come back. It, it well, he owns the real estate. I mean, the, the company owns the real estate now. So it, they'll continue to own the real estate. It's already approved for a uh, wine production facility and it will be used for that purpose. Um, there just wouldn't have enhancements made uh, to the property. I mean, there might be some, but it would be stuff that doesn't require, uh, you know, any kind of zoning compliance because if it did it would trigger a process yeah. and then we'd be we wouldn't be able to comply so it's it's just going to look like the way it does for a while and that's not a threat it's just the reality i mean we, the, the wine production has to happen um, that's part of the business model it's immediate the the the, the uh, stainless steel vats are inside the facility now waiting to be uh, connected when the remodel happens so we basically lose the investment and the increase in property value that would come from the development of this project is that what but you're we don't saying? know if there we, is we don't we, know if there is any because we, there's nothing tied we don't know if there's any investment other than half a million dollars maybe perhaps. but well it says, he says 10 million i mean that's why i wonder so it's I, I did i did it i just did they don't put math on the bar exam so i reserve the right to be wrong um but if i do is your your overall tax rates about what Everything included? Do you know off the top of your head? But I mean, but but the whole community is like two seventy something, maybe. If it's two set, do you know what it is? It's about that, yeah. Yeah, so that's it's about a quarter million dollars. Yeah. If, if he's putting that much money yep. into it. If it assesses at that. Yeah. That's the question. I mean, whether he puts. I wish. I wish we could say, hey, he says he's put ten million into it. He's going to put ten million. Into it's it. just that's not really zoning. I mean, but. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the AB of, of the other comparable property? Say, say that what's, again. What's the AB of the urban vines? Sorry, I know the property. Oh, I don't. Off, it's not comparable. It's not even close. And I don't know the answer to, yeah. to the question. I just, I think North Fork pledged a, a $10 million uh, yes. value. For, what question. did I say? Yeah. North Fork. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm just going to do this. Can we please make a mo well? I'd like to make a motion to delay this until either next the next meeting, so at least we can better fact find. And and, and as I told you, I hate the fact that we can't all seven get together and try to figure out everything. I mean, but I mean, I'm, but it, you could hold a special meeting, I suppose. I mean, but 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 you know, at least to get maybe three people together to create an ad hoc committee, just at least till the next meeting to try to figure out some of these things. So at least I understand the financial aspects of it, or the the, the, the downside and the upside to it. Is that can I, yeah, do, can I do that? From the date of certification, you have 90 days. So yeah. Put that on your radar. Right. Um, and you can. I think Matt just said it. You, within 48 hours' notice, you can hold a special call whenever you guys want. Um, at, at this point, the governor's executive order is still in effect, so you can do it virtually. Um, so that's an option. If you all want to talk together. Okay. More, than, more than three of you. All right. Anyways, I, I'll make that motion. If nobody wants to do it, I'll second it. I mean, sure. somebody, somebody's saying something. What? I think Scott seconded it. Oh, he did. Okay. Yes, I, I would second that. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Okay. Motion has been made by Troy Patton to make, Troy, restate that, would you please? Yeah. It. Uh, make a motion to either have a special, can I say either a special meeting or an ad hoc? Table. I think at this point you just need to table it, table. and yes, then you can, do it, you can do the meeting separately. 
You'll okay. need to have a motion for the meeting. You mean separate, but we can okay. reach you to, to vote at our next meeting here, right? Okay, I'll make a motion to table the table meeting, table, table to vote till next time and create, have a meeting within that period of time or something. We'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Motion's yeah, made by Troy Penn, seconded by Scott Fry. Yep. Cindy, you want to call the roll? Joe Edwards? Yes. Scott Willis? Yes. Cindy Spalgeri? Yes. Jake Gilbert? No. Mike Johns? Yes. Scott Fry? Yes. Troy Patton? Yes. Motion carries 6 1. Thank Counselor, you. while you're still up there, what uh, alcoholic beverages are going to be served besides wine? Served beside wine? Yes. Uh, well, they they manufacture wine products when the, the cidery will produce cider project. Is there a beer wine license? Does this does this site require a license? It, yes, it's a it's a, a brewing type of license. Correct? Is there? <coughs> yes. And I'm assuming the account the uh, he would not want to go forward without being able to sell these ingredients, right? Sell. So, Beer and wine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, so, yeah, they they already produce it. So, okay. yeah, but, it's it's but wine, not, beer, and cider. He's not going to go forward if he does not get to sell these ingredients. He's not going to sell just apple cider out there. Correct. Okay. I mean, yeah, it depends on what use we're talking about. The, yeah. the wine production. Well, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have a another bar out here i mean i I've, I've been in bars <laughs> i've, I've, I've seen I've, I've seen you in them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and have, have from time to time consume their product uh, but uh, do is this it looks like we've got a stripped down bar coming to that location yeah. and and that is that's not at all the intention and so That's hopefully this like me, hopefully this discovery will allay your your fears of that. Okay, well I, I yeah. that's what I hope. I hope yeah. I will learn more about this project. But I have been blistered by the residents out out there about the music. And I don't like that. In, in the last two and a half years. Oh yeah. From the time I was on here. Emails. I mean from the Emails residents around Urban Pines. Yeah. And so I, I don't like that. If we get the same stuff out here, uh, they probably send them to everybody. I assume. Be, to be really blunt, I mean that's what got me elected was Urban Vines, was the music. I can't tell you every door, every door in that uh, people say, "So you're we'll going to vote for you if you can stop it." Hmm. Yeah, you, you've got. So you get there's, elected there's again. A problem. <laughs> here's, uh, here, here's a cowboy bar out here next to. Uh, Sam. I'm, well, so, I'm, I'm paraphrasing naturally, but uh, well, I, 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 I'm hopeful that this conversation that we're going to have will uh, help okay, to address that's those. That's very good. Yeah. I hope so yep. too. Thanks, Matt. Can I? This is this is Scott. I'd like to ask one one more question, if I could. Yes. For, from from the time, let, let's uh, let's assume this uh, uh, gets to the point where it, it, it gets approved. <laughs> Excuse me. What what is the what is the time frame involved before uh, being open for business? So. So I'm going to I'm going to say this and I'm going to look to Noah just to confirm but we our engineering we're ready to pull the trigger on the next level of engineering uh, as soon as uh, uh, our approvals our uh, our zoning approval is completed and then we'll begin work on the site at, at as early next year as possible correct um, and then the uh, and we have a year one year from the adoption uh, the this area must be completed within 20, uh, within uh, uh, one year of the adoption. This area must be completed within two years of the adoption. Uh, and, and so does that help? Yes, it, it does. And, and I think that in, in my mind, that's uh, part of the reason for that question is uh, the point that Councilor Patton brought up, which was, you know, how do we, how do we, what assurances do we have that when this opens, it's going to open as it's, you know, uh, and it sounds like you're, you're, you're saying there's a multi-stage, but that's already drawn out. Um, but we know it's going to be, you know, ready for prime time when, when, when the doors open and, and, and that's going to be sooner rather than later. Yeah, it, that is, that is in fact the case. And then secondly, 
I mean, there can't be any alterations. I mean, this is locked down about as closely as any PUD that I've, I've seen the city uh, consider. Uh, there really isn't a lot of margin for change from what you're seeing here uh, without going back through the whole process again. Sure. All right, you, you, you've answered my question. I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, future conversation on this. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt. Moving on, our next uh, item is Resolution 21-136, Fiscal Plan for Ordinance 21-54. Uh, it's up for adoption consideration this evening. And Council, I'm sorry, President John, did you? Was a vote taken on after the second? Yeah. I, I got lost. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I did. Yeah. 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 It was, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, 6-1. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, 6 one. I thought Pam Howard was going to do the presentation. Pam, are you out there? No, th this is Kevin Todd here um, filling in for Pam. Okay. The uh, next two items on your agenda, Resolution 21136 and Ordinance 2154, um, I'll just present those kind of together um their their companion um items that should be considered together but this is a 100 percent voluntary annexation request um which is the ordinance 2154 and then the associated fiscal plan for a little bit over three acres located at 1602 east 203rd street um, as shown in table five which was i believe just on the screen uh, the estimated net impact for this annexation over the next five years is um, $469. The public hearing for the ordinance was held at your December 13th meeting and is eligible for adoption this evening. Um, and with that, I think we'll, we'll open up for any discussion or questions. Thanks. There, I understand there's no request for city services other than utility. They're not, they're not requesting utilities. Is this correct? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'm ready. I believe the council would, would suggest we vote on these two items separately. So. Do I have a motion on resolution 21-136? Motion. Uh, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Motion to approve resolution 21-136. <laughs> Second. Second. Motion made by Troy Patton. Seconded by Joe Edwards. Cindy, would you call the roll, please? Scott Willis. Yes. Cindy Spalgeri. Yes. Jake Gilbert. Jake Gilbert. Okay. Mike Johns. Yes. Scott Fry. Yes. Troy Patton? Yes. Joe Edwards? Yes. Jake, are you there? He says no. Okay. All right, motion carries 6 0. Okay. Um, do I then have a motion with respect to Ordinance 21 54? I move that we approve Ordinance 21 54. Second. Motion made by Scott Fry, seconded by Troy Patton. Cindy, would you call the roll, please? Yep. Joe Edwards? Yes. Cindy Spolgeri? Yes. Mike Johns? Yes. Troy Patton? Yes. Scott Willis? Yes. Uh, Scott Fry? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Okay. Um, at this point, there are no items of new business. Do we have any guests who wish to address the council this evening? Chris, any cards? Okay. Okay. Moving on then to uh, clerk treasurer comments. Um, not this evening. Not this evening. Okay. City council comments. So uh, why don't we start with Cindy Spurger? Quick, quick review of the APC. Wait, we didn't have any guest comments. Did we go through that and then just miss it? No. I'm so sad. I wish we had more people who wanted to come talk to us. Um, the APC did not have a first meeting of this month, so our next meeting will actually be Tuesday and not Monday, uh, January 18th. Um, did want to mention ARPA, so, I, and I'll just read something I wrote here. So, the final guidance on the use of funds was sent out from Treasury, um, U.S. Treasury, Friday, 
And while Senate Bill 311 has not been passed at this time, the new guidance essentially has the same impact for us as if it had passed. The explanation is somewhat complicated, but they are allowing up to $10 million in funds uh, for jurisdictions to be used to accommodate revenue loss, whether you have calculated the loss or not. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like a standard deduction. Um, that's how my brain is seeing this. So, you know, you can get itemized, you take your standard deduction, and they're basically allowing you to take this standard deduction up to $10 million. And our entire disbursement is 9.8, so that means the entirety of our funds then um, would be opened up basically to be used for anything normally that could be funded from our general revenues. Um, this is significant, obviously. I mean, that, that is a big, big thing for us to be considering as a community. When we did our first plan and approved that plan here, the general plan, um, there was a lot of restrictions. And so when we came up with our spending plan, it was in light of those. It didn't necessarily encompass everything we wanted to do. It had to encompass our restrictions. So now knowing there's basically not those restrictions, it really does open it up uh, for us to make some potentially different decisions. So in light of that, just, just so you know, our next ARPA meeting is scheduled for January 19th, uh, which is next week at two o'clock. We will be obviously discussing this and the implications, um, but I wanted to ask all counselors and department heads and the public to think about the priorities for the funds in light of the changes uh, with this guidance. Um, I don't wanna go at this lightly. We don't have to rush. We can take our time and really make sure that these funds are transformational for our community. So if you have thoughts on any of this, please do send them to me. I'm not like the leader of this in a grand way and you can send them to any of us on the committee. I guess I've just been a repository in making sure um, that they're handled by our committee. So if you do wanna get anything to me, I'll make sure it gets out to the rest of our committee. Um, and this is kind of a separate note, and I wasn't sure if Mike or Mayor, anyone was gonna bring it up, um, but redistricting and whether or not we wanna to move to a second class city are both big things that we need to address very soon in, in Westfield. So in, generally, in general, practically speaking, a move to second class would bring our council districts to six with three at large, and also instead of a elected treasurer, it would be an appointed controller. Um, so that, I mean, practically speaking for us, those are the major changes uh, that the community would feel in terms of how, um, how we're governed. So it's been a long time since our last redistricting as well. 10 years? Thought it was even more than that, but it's just 10, huh? Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's something that we have to undertake um, fairly quickly. So I don't know how we plan to do that, but again, I think we need our council to be moving forward, making these kind of decisions. I think we'll need some help from community development and our GIS department potentially to be looking at, at the uh, census tract data, precinct information. So uh, Mayor, I'm hoping you will allow us to communicate with them to get the resources we need to make those decisions. Thank you. That's it. As soon as the um, oversight committee can meet, why we're going to take up that issue. And but Jake is kind of out of commission right now, and he's a part of it, and I want his input too. So, just lastly, on the finance, Mike, um, we didn't have our meeting in January. People were sick, frankly, um, so. We, I mean, we just couldn't, couldn't meet. I mean, and it's been kind of running through of all of us. Um, so um, hopefully either we'll meet at the end of this month uh, to kind of make up for that. Um, I, I will note one thing on in Cindy's comments with ARPA. Um, I, I, and I do think this is something that, you know, we should look at as a city, um, you know, because a lot of people are going to be asking us for money. And uh, I, I think it's, prudent that we as a city council or as a city when we're assessing whether who wants money or who doesn't have money 
that we have at least a, a minimum set of standards and whether those those companies are not for profits have been have been good stewards of not only their own books and records uh, but of other things in the community um, uh, whether whether we approve them or not approve them and I think that's something that needs to be said so that's it thank you thank you um, I got just a quick kind of almost a little laundry list of <coughs> related topics since it's been a while with the holidays haven't we haven't talked a lot uh, old business I would say that the council certainly hopes that the mayor and the clerk treasurer are able to formally uh, end the litigation by the end of this month we're hoping that that can be done and we can move forward and understand there may be a criminal investigation that's ongoing, but hopefully the rest of it can be done. Um, Want to uh, just mention this as far as the budget heads up goes. I spent some time with the clerk's treasurer's office last week, and I know we've got right now there's there's forty eight thousand dollars in BKD invoices that are outstanding that the ad hoc committee is going to go through. Whether that number in the end is still 48 or whether it's something less than that, I just want to let, remind everybody that those specific funds are going to be charged against the 2022 budget as they've closed the books for 2021. And so we'll need to take that into account that our, what our consulting uh, budget has been decimated by that amount or dropped by that amount anyway moving forward for the year. Um, also, I had a, sent an email to Public Works today. I had met with the clerk treasurer's office, and we've talked in the past about State Road 32 and the fact that we need to have $7.5 million uh, in cash ready to pay them at the end of the year, next January at this time. Uh, I've asked that the clerk treasurer work with Jeremy Lawler and basically escrow $625,000 a month over a 12-month period, that will be our $7.5 million, and that they work together to make sure that those funds are set aside and not just floating around so that when it does come the end of the year, the money is there to pay our debt. Uh, different issue, looking back on 20, 2021 uh, tw and looking forward to 2022, I think it's important that as the counselors we've talked, we'd like to make sure that we're able to communicate better with our residents of Westfield as far as what's the, the council accomplished during the course of the year? What do we want to accomplish uh, in this year versus last year? So um, I'd like our counselors to kind of think about what means, what methods we could do to, to, to get, that, get the word out and in the meantime, also, if, if all of you would just make a, just jot a couple lines down, what are the three items that you think were the top accomplishments for our city council in 2021? And what are the five goals that you think we need to address in 2022 so that we can reach a consensus on that and then share that with our residents so they know what our thoughts are as we move forward. So, uh, so we don't, don't get in, in the way of any open door policies. Please don't share them amongst each other. Just send me, give me an email with those quick thoughts down and I'll try to compilate them and we'll share them as a, as a group, okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, I think we're looking forward to uh, several new projects coming before this uh, council in the next uh, four to six weeks. A pretty, it's gonna be a pretty exciting time. Uh, these are some projects that the mayor and I have been working on over the last, over the last quarter. Uh, at our next meeting, we've got a streetscape committee, uh, which is Kristen Berkman, and she's going to address the city council and explain to us what's going on with that committee and talk a little bit about uh, the uh, State Road 32, um, the design for the landscaping and the streetscape, as we found out that's got to be done by, uh, by the end of March. So that committee is working on work getting that put together. Uh, we're also gonna have a uh, presentation on trail safety project coming up where Dr. Tim Hannon, who is a Carmel City Council member, is, is, uh, is gonna come to speak to us about uh, adopting a best practices for our trails usage uh, countywide. 
and we as a city council, Joe and I, uh, specifically have met with the other presidents and vice presidents from the six, seven other city councils in Hamilton County. We, we being the city of Westville, we propose that we look at our, at our, at our trails as an economic driver for Hamilton County, and based upon that meeting, we now are moving forward uh, with some ideas as to how to do that from a trail safety standpoint. Uh, we've also got a historical uh, preservation ordinance coming before us, uh, and Jonathan Nail is going to be presenting that to us. That's something that the state is requiring we consider adoption. If we are going to adopt it, that has to be done by the end of March, so there's some immediacy to that. And then the other thing I would piggyback on top of what uh, Councilor Patton said earlier, um, there are going to be a lot of non-for-profits that are going to be coming to us looking and asking uh, for our assistance with respect to the RIP. And I think one of the first ones that's going to be uh, on our books to see, if you will, is the YMCA. And they've already requested a meeting with us on, uh, on Monday, uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th. So we, I think we need to give some hard thought to the use of those ARPA funds because those, those asks are coming forward. So um, that's my, my thoughts, my report for today. Mayor Cook. I think just one thing, and that was last past Saturday, rather quietly, Westfield at Grand Park hosted the uh, Georgia Bulldogs in their practice session out at uh, the event center. And I would guess most of us would probably like to get home and see uh, just how they're doing right now. So I'll end with that. Thank you, thank you. That will we'll end the meeting. Thank you all. Don't leave.